Well, good morning to you all. It's my privilege to uh, have this opportunity to open the word uh, to you this morning. No one needs to be reminded that we are in the midst of a culture war. I think everyone would be in agreement with that. There seems to be almost World War III level conflict between the forces of secularism on the one hand and the values of Judeo-Christian heritage on the other. It seems like there's no points of contact, no points of agreement. And yet I'd suggest to you that there is one, at least one notion about the human condition that I believe virtually everyone, everywhere, would agree on, no matter their age, their gender, or their cultural background. This might be kind of the de facto or default response when someone makes a mistake, indiscretion, screw up, oversight, failure, peccadillo, or otherwise cleverly described term for whatever what the Bible clearly calls sin. What is that response? Well, you hear it all the time. Well, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. And on a human level, of course, this is quite true, and certainly in line with the biblical concept of sin. And yet the word of God clearly speaks of one being in the universe who is in fact perfect. And then displays that perfection both in the written law of God that we've just sung about, preserved and recorded in the Old Testament, as well as in the life and teaching of the perfect law keeper, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the law of God is not simply a practical, moral code, but instead, I'd suggest to you, it's a stunning portrayal of the beautiful character of our triune God. We see these truths unfolded in our text for today. If you would turn to Matthew 5, we'll look at verses 33 through 48. I'll read it in a moment. In this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus, the Messianic King, both rightly interpret the beautiful law of God, and we see that that law perfectly expresses the perfection of the Heavenly Father. And he also calls his disciples to a lifestyle that is drawn not from the norms of the surrounding society, but from the character of God as revealed in his word. It's a radical understanding and practice of that law that we as Christians are called to. Now we need to acknowledge the impossibility of fully meeting this radical biblical ethic, this side of heaven. And nonetheless, we as disciples of Jesus in union with him by faith, are to pursue this ethic in our speech, our responses to opposition, and in our love for neighbor and even our enemies, so that in Christ we reflect the perfection of our Heavenly Father. That's my message to you this morning. Be a radical reflection of perfection. Be a radical reflection of perfection. Let's read uh, the text, Matthew 5, verses 33 through 48. I'm reading from the new, I'm sorry, the English Standard Version. Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, Do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. 
You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let me pray. Lord, this is your word. We're thankful for it. We thank you that the law of the Lord, as we just sung, is perfect. Oh God, we don't understand that fully. And we don't understand how we can be reflections of your perfection. And yet, it is what you call us to. Lord, I do pray, as we just sung, that you would make the meditations of my mouth and heart to be acceptable in your sight. Bless us as we meditate on your word together, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, the first thing I'd like to suggest to you from this text, actually, we're going to go back in the chapter because we need to see that the teaching of Jesus is, first of all, a radical reaffirmation, not a repudiation, of the law of God. Let me define my terms here. You're going to hear me use the word radical in all my points this morning. Radical, among other things, according to Webster, means marked by a considerable departure from the usual or traditional. Jesus, in his teaching here, is radically departing from the usual traditional understanding of the law by the scribes and Pharisees. We need to go back to verses 17 to 20, if you'll go there, because this is the interpretive key to the entire antithesis section of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, starting in verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a yota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So chapter 5, verses 17 to 20 set the context for the entire rest of Matthew 5. Jesus clearly here is affirming continuity with the Old Testament law, validity. He is not teaching something new, something novel. He's removing from underneath the pile of human tradition and works righteousness that the Pharisees and scribes had created. He's reviewing, revealing the beauty of the law of God. It's like when someone finds a diamond in the rough. He's uncovering that for the people of God. My next point is that the life, and we're going to see three sections of our text here. So we're next going to look back at verses 33 through 37. If you'll look there. We see that the life of a radical disciple speaks louder than his words. Jesus here is correcting a misplaced emphasis of the law by the scribes and Pharisees. They were looking at Numbers 30, Deuteronomy 23, where we're told that we should not swear falsely, we should keep our oaths. The Pharisees and scribes, however, focus not on what you were swearing to, but who you were swearing by. There's a whole section of the Mishnah on what are oaths that you really should keep because you're swearing by God and those that you should not because you're swearing by something else. Um, they miss the point. Now, just so we don't misunderstand, Jesus is not here forbidding oath-taking per se. We see it in Scripture. We see the patriarchs 
uh, making oaths. We see Jesus before the Sanhedrin when he was put under oath responding. We see God in Hebrews 6 actually swearing by himself. Oath taking is sometimes necessary due to the gravity of the situation. What Jesus is really after here, I'd suggest, is he's after a heart and a life of integrity where truth reigns supreme. You don't need an oath to back up your words. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Dropping down to the next section, verses 38 through 42. We see here that a disciple of Jesus reflects a radical retaliation, as it were, in personal matters. Jesus is here correcting a misapplication of the law. The law of retaliation in Deuteronomy 19, also known as the lex talionis in Latin, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, it was designed for the civil authority to administer public penalty to make the crime fit the punishment, or the punishment fit the crime. Sorry about that. And it was designed to discourage personal vengeance. And yet the Pharisees misapplied this law, actually caused people to break the law by applying this to personal matters of justice. Jesus instead promotes an ethic of kindness, such as the world's never seen, that is echoed and it's applied by the Apostle Paul in a beautiful passage in Romans 12, where he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a radical retaliation, heaping coals upon your enemy's head. Um, that's Paul's version. We see this uh, radical uh, response throughout Scripture. Think of Joseph and his response to his brothers in Egypt. Think of David sparing Saul when he had the opportunity to harm him. Think of Stephen praying even as he's being stoned to death. Think of Jesus on the cross interceding for his persecutors. Think of the movie. Perhaps you're a moviegoer. I like some movies. I don't see a whole lot, but we just saw the latest version of Les Mis. And one of the most touching scenes in Les Mis is when the priest is sinned against by Jean Valjean and instead of taking his right to justice, he absorbs Jean Valjean's sin against him, offers mercy. That's what we're called to in this passage. Well, skipping down to verses 43 through 47, we see here a radical love that the disciple of Christ is called to reflect. Jesus here is correcting a mistaken misinterpretation of the law and in fact an unwarranted addition to the law. Deuteronomy 19, 18 is where, you, uh, where Jesus quotes, love your neighbor as yourself. If you go back to that passage, you actually see that love is emphasized over vengeance there. There's no mention of hating an enemy. Nowhere in the Old Testament will you find that we are to hate our enemies. This popular misunderstanding led to a contrast in the Jewish mind between who your neighbor is and who your enemy is. That was kind of the reason for the parable about who's my neighbor. And this wall that was set up between Jew and Gentile came out of this sort of understanding. We need to understand that Jesus ministered in what one author called an intensively narrow-minded, exclusivistic, and intolerant environment in which love your enemies must have startled his audience. Does that sound anything like contemporary culture? Jesus taught, in fact, that everyone should see 
His disciples should see their neighbor in everyone, even Samaritans, another famous parable. In the book, The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy are taken to a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. And Corey Ten Boom relates the story of her sister uh, when they find out the news of who their betrayer was in Holland. And Corey is overcome with rage when she finds out who this man, Jan Vogel, was. How could he do this? His sister, her sister's response, however, was, yes, I've been praying for Jan. I, I, I feel so bad for him. To which Corey is wondering, my sister is from another planet. How can she be praying for Jan Vogel? She was praying for her persecutor because she was full of the love of this Jesus, this radical love. I suggest to you and myself today, brothers and sisters, that prayer for our enemies, whether they're real or perceived, is one way to have them become not your enemy. Prayer is a true act of love. I need to pray for my boss more. I'm at odds with my boss. I need to pray for my boss. I need to pray for my wife, my kids. I sometimes look at them as my enemy. Prayer is a true act of love. We need this radical love. Loving enemies and praying for persecutors evidences, according to the text, our true sonship. Children imitate their father. Those who don't love like this in the text are likened to the outcasts of Jewish days, tax collectors and Gentiles, or in our days, perhaps drug dealers and sex offenders. We're called to a radical love. And then we come to verse 48. We must come to verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You've heard this before. You've heard it in the Old Testament when the Lord God says, you must be holy as I am holy in Leviticus 19. Or in Deuteronomy 18, the text says, you shall be perfect before Jehovah your God. Perfect in that text is actually in the Septuagint the same word that we have in our text here, teleos. And yet teleos is a wider term than our concept of moral flawlessness. You'll find it other places in the New Testament used for spiritual maturity. The perfection of the Father is seen especially in the love that he shows for sinners a truly radical love that we're called by Jesus to imitate. And yet, if we're honest before God, we don't. Isn't that true? We need to repent of careless words and promises, selfish and fearful responses to evil, of lovelessness. The question comes down to it for me in this text. How... Shall I, how shall you be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? How shall you be a radical reflection of perfection? It's only in union with Jesus, the perfect Son of God, that you can meet the demands of verse 48. Did you hear that? Only in union with Jesus Christ. As we consider the biblical ethic described and demanded by Christ in Matthew 5, recall the picture of Jesus offered by Peter in his first epistle. I love these words. Jesus who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. This testimony of Peter shows the lack of personal vengeance displayed in the life of Christ, especially in his passion. He did not resist the evildoers aligned against him, but instead poured out his life for his people, the ultimate giving of himself to all who asked of him. Jesus shows radical love for his enemies by dying on the cross for them and even praying from the cross for his persecutors. This was a direct fulfillment of his word in our text. 
love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. He thereby truly demonstrated his sonship, which he then conveys to you and to me by saving faith. And so your sonship in Christ portrays the radical life and love of the one of whom Paul testifies. But God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Living in union with this Christ gives you the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees and opens the kingdom of heaven to you. This is the gospel found in Matthew 5. It's the gospel you and I need every day, in fact, every moment of every day, so that you may be a radical reflection of perfection. Let's pray. Lord, this is a challenging text. It exposes us in our sin, and it throws us upon you, Lord Jesus, our great high priest, our prophet, our king. You who have offered union so that we can be clothed in robes of righteousness greater than those of the scribes and Pharisees. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for offering us relationship that enables us to fulfill this word. Lord, help us when we fall and fail. Give us grace to look to you and to move on. Lord, we bless you for your word. Thank you for it. In Christ, amen.